going to practice anything else? We're going to practice else. anything else?
of many faith paths and of no faith, we come together as community in testimony what people can do despite differences <coughs> in the name of love and justice. Good morning. Good morning. I am Phil Park Thomas, your service associate this morning. Reverend Tim Barger, our senior minister, will be leading the service this morning. Today is Easter, the highest holy day of the calendar year for Christians worldwide. It is also the 20th day of the sacred month of Ramadan as observed by Muslims. Ten days ago was the Persian and Baha'i holy day of no roots marking the beginning of spring. The same day was observed by many pagans and Wiccans as, a, as Astara. In less than two weeks, many Buddhists around the world will observe the Theravada New Year. And our previous week began with Holi, the Hindu service or festival of colors. And lest we forget, that very special holy day so many U.S. citizens anticipate with such eagerness each year comes on April 15. <laughs> In this particular year, Jewish Passover and Christian Holy Week do not overlap. Passover this year will begin on April 22nd. On piano is Jeffrey Maxey, our church music director. He will not only be providing instrumental music, but also directs our choir. Our story today is provided by Ginny Gottman, our director of lifelong learning and religious education. Our media group is led by producer director Walter McGee. He's assisted by Andy Gottman on cameras and Eric Sills on soundboard. Again, good morning and welcome to First Unitarian of Toledo. And we extend our greetings to folks beyond this sanctuary who may be joining us online via YouTube. There is a message of hope in Easter for all of us, regardless of our personal faith journeys. Easter, like spring itself, reminds us that there is always hope arising. Even when the forces of tyranny and evil seek to crush love and the work of justice, love and justice arise again. So whether we are theist, atheist, pagan, Wiccan, Christocentric, or other variety of truth seeker, let us join together in community to be renewed in love, to be strengthened in the ongoing struggle for justice, and reaffirm the bonds of community. And good morning, I'm Reverend Tim. Let me add to Phil's welcome to you here in the sanctuary and to our viewers on YouTube, whether you're watching our live stream or tuning in later uh, for video on demand. Uh, here in the sanctuary, we have the strong smell of Easter flowers in the sanctuary. Yes. So I am <clears throat> hopeful that you appreciate the view of the flowers and that the spring sneezes will not overwhelm my speaking today. In many Unitarian Universalist churches, including ours, we light a chalice, a flame in a bowl, with a link to a 20th century practice in our services. Um, shall we say the words for chalice lighting together? The words will be on the screen. We are Unitarian Universalists with minds that think, hearts that love, and hands that are ready to serve. Together, we care for our earth and work for friendship and peace in our world. Covenant. 
And while we're reciting together this covenant, let us say, well, while we're reciting together, let us say the covenant of our congregation. This is not a creed, but what we share with general agreement and what we as a religious community work toward. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is the sacrament, and its service is its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Today, on our minds, in our hearts, and with our spirits, we think of the ways of the world, the state of the nation, the serenity of our own souls. There are people in our circles who, with their family and friends, have challenges of life and death, health and illness, home and travel, financial security and monetary stress. Decisions are being made by ourselves and others on how we can live our best lives, which sometimes means aspiring to that and realizing we have moves yet to make to reach aims and goals. Speaking of that, today is Trans Day of Visibility, when we can appreciate the transgender people in our lives and in this world. Let lives be seen, cherished, and given the dignity we all should have. Individual and family ways go on too, with new lives born and many other joys and celebrations. May we be compassionate to all as we don't know what other people are going through. So treat one another well with compassion. And may we be glad for their celebrations and ours. One date that Phil didn't mention Tomorrow is April Fool's Day. <laughs> if you celebrate foolishness, make it fun, not cruel. We have on our minds, in our hearts, with our spirits, the fact that there is disaster by nature and disaster caused by humans. We think especially of the wars in Israel and Palestine, in Russia and Ukraine. We know that inequality, inequity, and racism are in our societies, and we can do our own parts not to oppress, to celebrate many cultures, to grow in self and universally. One reason we join in religious gatherings is to realize common links. The uncommon is here too. Let's be together in faith, hope, and love physically and in spirit. You might have your own items for meditation, contemplation, and prayer, so we include the unsaid here, as we are in community. We can share burdens and be glad for accomplishments. And now please join us for our opening hymn, number 63, Spring Has Now Unwrapped the Flowers. The lyrics will be on the, sc on the screen. 346. Three, that was last week, maybe. Let's try 346. Come sing a song with me. Yeah. And I'll bring a 
like to first invite all of my littler friends to come forward so they can see a little better if they would like to. You are not obligated. <laughs> I, was, I turned around to look behind me to see what everybody was so excited about. <clears throat> Who knows what this is? What is it? What is it? Who can tell me? Jalen. It's a chest, more specifically. Sawyer. The Wonder Box. Everybody say ooh. ooh. Everybody say ah. ah. Who would like to open the Wonder Box today? OK, let's, in let's invite our new friend to open the Wonder Box today and tell us what you see in there. You can hold it up if you want to. Owls? I'm going to take this. And what else do you see in there besides owls? A book. What's on the cover of the book? That's actually kind of a hard question. That, on the cover of the book, is a fetus. So, if you have been a UU for a while, you might be one of the people saying, yay, owl is back, I'm so excited. And if you have not been a UU for a while, you might be thinking, oh my God, what? I don't know what that is and I don't want to ask. So I will tell you, OWL stands for Our Whole Lives. It is a comprehensive, inclusive, evidence-based, lifespan sexuality program that was put together by our church and the United Church of Christ. OWL, um, deals with human bodies and relationships and sexualities, which are things that are so integral to who we are, and they are so transformative as we go through ages and stages. They are profoundly complicated. So how do kids go about learning about this very complicated, enormous, enormous subject in an age-appropriate way? Usually, the answer is they don't. When I was a kid, for example, I would listen to what my older siblings were saying, and my friends would listen to their older siblings, and we'd talk to the kids on the bus, and we'd whisper on the playground and say, what is this? I don't know what that means. How do you do this? What does that do? And we clammed up when other people walked by because it was embarrassing, and we didn't want to be laughed at, and I, we didn't want to get in trouble. This is not a good approach to teaching about such a complicated relationship. Whispering and secrets breeds misinformation, and it, breed, it breeds shame. It makes children more vulnerable to both propaganda and bad actors. And it leaves kids by themselves to learn through life, largely by trial and error. A few years ago, I taught OWL in a different church to kindergartners and first graders. And 
Teaching OWL was the opposite of shameful and embarrassing and secretive. It was a perfectly normal class. We were straightforward and honest. We told the kids, you know, these are bodies. Everybody has one. They're very common. We can talk about them. We'll tell you things. If you have questions, ask them. We will answer you in an age-appropriate way. And nobody is going to giggle <clears throat> at you for not knowing, because that's why we're here. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we talked to the kids about things like, these are the parts of the body. These are what they're called. All bodies look different, and that is perfectly fine. There are some things that we can do in public. There are some things that we do in private. You don't touch anybody else's body without asking first. And if anybody wants to touch your body, if they ask for a hug and you don't want a hug, you can say no. Your body belongs to you. You are in charge of it. This is where babies come from. Some bodies make a cell called a sperm. Some bodies make a cell called an egg. And when the sperm and the egg meet, that forms the very, very, very beginnings of what is going to be a baby. And that specific lesson, the one about conception, had two different lesson plans, one with not much detail and one with a fair amount of detail. Ta-da! And we could choose which one we thought would be best for our kids. OWL is for our whole lives. They have curricula for kindergarten and first graders, fourth through sixth graders, seventh through ninth graders, 10th through 12th graders, young adults aged 18 to 35, adults and older adults. This is an enormous body of, of knowledge and training to be an OWL teacher is intense. Sandra Kosick Sills and I, Sandra Kosick Sills and I, just trained to be teachers for junior high and high school aged kids. And the training was a lot. We had to go through 20 hours of class time, in addition to roughly 10 to 15 hours of homework time. It's a commitment, and it is a thing that our entire church, all Unitarian Universalists, take very, very seriously. Teaching sexuality is a fundamental component of our faith. We are about to start teaching OWL classes to 10th through 12th graders. It's coming up very soon. There is a mandatory parents meeting on April 7th. If you know any 10th through 12th graders who would like to be involved, talk to me or talk to Sandra. So all of this is just the briefest of overviews about OWL. If you have further questions, feel free to come to me. I will be more than happy to answer you in an honest and an age-appropriate way. <laughs> Thank you. And let's sing for the children, as this is the time when they and their teachers leave our service for religious education. <laughs>
Thank you, Jeffrey. This is our time for meditation, contemplation, and prayer. The words I bring today are The Season of Flowers by Paul R. Beadle. And Paul Beadle is the minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Little Rock, Arkansas. Six weeks ago, our Christian neighbors held their rite of ashes. And this past week, they scattered palms from which next year's ashes will be made and commemorated the death of the ancient leader whose ministry inspires their faith and traditions. Today, they celebrate the story of a miracle, which is known as his victory over death and is said to be the salvation of all people. They have been doing this now for thousands of years at the season when the earth awakes from winter, the season of the flowers. Just as our Jewish neighbors at the same season celebrate a miracle of liberation from oppression, just as our neighbors of other faiths, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, and more, celebrate the birth of gods and the start of new years, just as we each year celebrate the earth, our home. Come what may, O spirit of life, help us to see beyond belief to the goods and blessings and values that we in our common humanity use these symbols and seasons to remember. May we and our neighbors of all faiths and no faith also remember what binds us across our differences of custom and belief. May we see beyond our common humanity, our common commitments. And may we together fill the world with love, understanding, and peace. In the spirit, by the spirit, with the spirit giving power, so may it be, amen. Let us enter into one minute of silence together.
to gold, refine gold, to paint the lily, to throw a perfume on the violet, to smooth the ice or add another line. Unto the rainbow or with taper light to seek the beauteous eye of heaven to garnish is wasteful and ridiculous excess from King John by William Shakespeare. Happy Easter, everybody. For some of you, this is a day to celebrate the defining story of Christianity, that Jesus died by execution on Friday, the first day of his death, and came back to life on Sunday, the third day. That storied religious miracle the resurrection being something that a supernatural God could make happen is really why 2,000 years later, this advocate of the golden rule who preached blessed are the peacemakers is a spiritual icon to about 2.4 billion people, more than three out of every 10 people in the world and why non-Christians should be knowledgeable of his life too, as they and we should know something about the Muslim prophet Muhammad, about the Buddha, and about other people who changed the ways of religion in their lifetimes long ago and still are remembered and venerated today. Of course, there is a range of fervor and devotion to religious followers. Like any group of people, have a range of involvement or commitment. So some of Jesus's people and Muhammad's and Buddha's and others over the centuries and today are devout and others might call themselves Christians or Muslims or Buddhists, or another faith, or no faith, but not really live according to the teachings of their sacred savior or follow other guidance. But the stories remain important, and all people deserve respect and dignity. Today is Easter, the day for Jesus. You might remember that Jesus is also a prophet in the Islamic faith. And the Islamic people, like Phil said, are still in their holy month of Ramadan, a focused time of religious contemplation. Ramadan will end with an Eid, a festival, 10 days from now. For Buddhists, the Theravada New Year, Theravada is one of the major categories among Buddhists who observe in different ways, Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism being other categories. And today's really not the time to detail how one is distinct from the other. I just wanna point out since I brought up Buddhism in the spirit of recognizing world religions, that the Theravada New Year comes on the 13th of April in 2024 so Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists all are in or near times of celebration. And Passover, a Jewish observance, remember Jesus was a Jew, begins this year on April 22nd. All of that again to show that Easter comes in a festive time for many people, but it's a Christian celebration, plus there's some cultural, not really religious attention here in the US and elsewhere, where we've brought baskets of eggs, the presence of bunnies, 
plenty of candy, special bonnets, and big buffet feasts into the Easter theme. Here at First Unitarian Church of Toledo, I understand there's an egg hunt for the children. And our kitchen coordinator, Carla Logan Mercer, was here yesterday boiling some eggs to make egg salad for coffee hour. And I think I convinced her to make some deviled eggs too. And I don't know how heretical that might be. <laughs> Even though the verb devil means to season highly, so it's not directly relating to heaven and a hell run by the devil mythology. And remember that our universalist ancestors didn't even believe in the hell concept of torment and punishment in some kind of eternal existence after your human life has ended. But I like deviled eggs. <laughs> even though the cholesterol is not at the low level my doctors want to see. I get to say it's Easter and let's celebrate. And something about society. Easter used to be one of two days in the year when the pews would be full in a church, Christmas Eve being the other, because vestiges stayed with us of the time when church attendance was a social norm in the US and the days celebrating Jesus' birth and resurrection were the ones it seemed everyone tried to attend. If families went no other time during the year, that still marked their Christian alliance, it seems, or at least might keep them out of that hell I referred to. Easter being a special day that you must go to church was special for us Unitarian Universalists a few decades ago too, from my viewing our Toledo Unitarian News of the time. Now, I'm not sure what it would take to bring overflow seating in here, but if you have ideas, please let me know. In our Unitarian Universalist way, we kind of hope that the greatest attendance is for the Sunday of our annual meeting, May 19th this year, when members exercise their voting in our structure of congregational polity. I'd like it to be for in-gathering in early September, the start of our church year, so people might decide to continue coming throughout the year. I'd prefer that the highest attendance be from a random Sunday and that we have more people all the time. Please say good things about First Unitarian and convince your friends and neighbors to come here. A little emphasis on Easter style attendance at other times might help us to rebuild membership. And again, to the Christians among us, uh, among our many faith and no faith people in our congregation, we honor Easter and your importance among us. And while we might take some things more lightly than you, as Unitarian Universalists, may we center everything on love, coming from concepts in the proposed revision of our denomination's guiding document from justice, equity, transformation, pluralism, interdependence, and generosity. I understand that those six terms could possibly have a seventh one if a vote at the Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly this summer approves a proposed amendment to add peace to that list. And if the entire revision of our principles and sources are taking on these values and inspirations in legal place of our principles and sources, which will still be a part of our church history and usage, if it passes by a vote of the assembly delegates. 
Another thing about Easter is that culturally in the Northern Hemisphere, it's pretty much a marker that it's time for spring. We've already had the spring equinox, and where we live, we're getting a mixture of warmer and cooler nights and days, but we know they'll soon stabilize and the weather will be warm again, consistently. We can put our heavy coats away any day now. Did March come in like a lion and today leave like a lamb? A couple days ago, high winds gave us lion time, so that wasn't precise to the calendar of early March. And we've had a few times when the rain showers seemed April-like, ahead of tomorrow's start of the month of April. It's seasonal transition time, not instant spring. Change is both gradual and sudden. And with weather, we often get times to experience what is to come before it all is upon us. Unless the total eclipse a week and a day from now somehow portends the end of the world. Let's focus more on science, not folkloric omens. But do come here next week when I'll talk about the sky. Today the fifth Sunday and final day of March 2024 is Easter Sunday. It's about time in this talk to get to the focus, the title of today's service, Lilies. That title is to mark both the Easter lily growing from a bulb annually with its trumpet metaphorically proclaiming that in this time of bloom, Jesus has also reemerged. And lilies in our community think all the way back to last August, just over seven months ago, when 29 peace lilies had been left at our church door with a note taped to the door stating, these go to a good home. Watch Gardener's World and do the homework for help on taking care of your new plant. And then a few more came to us soon after. How many of you took a peace lily home? And are your plants still thriving? We'll be generous in defining lilies. I'm not a biologist, and if we call a plant a lily, that's good enough for me. Apparently, some people insist that the only real lily has the scientific name Lilium. The Easter lily, scientific name Lilium longiflorum, is a true lily. It's not a local plant, but one originating in Taiwan and Japan. The peace lily, Spathofoliaris persistens, not lilium, is part of a species of plants native to tropical regions of the Americas and southeastern Asia. Here in Toledo, it's best as a house plant and might not survive the winter outdoors in the ground. The Easter lily as a true lily is toxic to cats and other animals. That's even if the cat licks pollen that it is on its coat. Many lilies are also toxic for dogs, and I'm not sure if that includes the Easter lily. So if you have true lilies at home, please keep your animals away. The peace lily, not a true lily, is only mildly toxic to humans and other animals when ingested, Wikipedia says it could still be harmful and take care with it. So have your lilies, whether peace, Easter, or another, like the water lily or the calla lily, neither, which, neither of which is a true lily either, I've found, 
So I intend just to ignore an aspect of perfectionism in science. Have these lilies helped you to consider Jesus' sayings from the biblical book of Luke? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these and to ponder the greater glory of nature, how beautiful the world is. That's one of the special parts of spring to me, all the rebirth that we see, natural resurrection in a way, with plants coming to life, weather reaching a point where we can more comfortably be outside in the world, where we kind of share the breath of the planet and not just the artificial climates of our homes and workplaces. It's time for rising. And that's a tie, of course, to Jesus' resurrection. May we rise in all ways, not just in rediscovering the world outside our cold weather routines. And there is the peace lily, which Wikipedia says got its common name from its symbolism for peace, purity, and healing, and has also been associated with the white flag, which is a signal for truce. Do we ever need all of that in our world, including a truce in Israel and Palestine over the war in Gaza? and proper peace in Ukraine with Russia ending its invasion. I was thinking of us, each person in today's service, being a lily. Think of that image. It doesn't matter what kind. Lilium, what's called a lily even if it's not, a lily that's special for symbolism, like the Easter lily with its trumpets, or one that seems commonplace and doesn't get the special attention of a holiday tie. We have our seasons, and this is a time to rise. Take in the regeneration that spring brings. Be a lily, bloom well. And be perennial. Let nature gloriously remake you every year. So be it. You didn't mention that garlic and onions are in the true lily family. Plant them, so if you plant your garlic around your doorstep, you won't be invaded by vampires. We now come to that time of our morning offering. We don't pass the plate in this congregation. But if you look at the screen up here, those of you who have smartphones can click on the... Uh, QR code and follow the directions to giving to our church. We've got that straightened out a few weeks ago. We had a few problems with the website. We also, you also may give through Venmo, that is, and uh, at First Unitarian Church in Toledo. You can also send in a check to our church at 3205 Glendale Avenue here in Toledo, 43604. And there's also a basket out in the lobby. Some people call that a narthex, where you can leave uh, uh, money in an envelope. There are envelopes in your pew if you wish to uh, give it more discreetly. And so we thank you for your generosity and uh, I believe Sandra and Marna have some words for us today. Uh, 
All right, so we have today's stewardship update. Uh, we are delighted to announce that the capital campaign has filled the chalice and we are lighting the flame with $308,171 in pledges from 59 pledge units. Keep those pledge coming. It's very important that everyone does their part, no matter how small it may seem. We are also collecting annual stewardship pledges at this time. So far, we are meeting the goal to increase pledges by at least 5% to keep up with inflation. Thank you for making your commitment so that the board can plan the coming year to meet our mission. If we all chip in, we can reach our goal. Thank, Thank you. you. Our offertory is number 1010 in the Teal Hymnal, but we found a second verse which will be on the screen. It's the coming soon part of our service where we tell you what's on the calendar for next week. We give some announcements and we also let you know what's up for right after the service. Join us for our spiritual forum at 945 on Sunday when our member Lawrence Anderson will give a special talk the day before the total solar eclipse which here on our church grounds will have 1 minute 52.1 seconds of total coverage. One week and one day until the eclipse, the current forecast gives a 35% chance that it will be cloudy. Lawrence, who is an emeritus professor of astronomy at the University of Toledo, will speak at next Sunday's spiritual forum on Will a dragon eat the sun tomorrow? Then for the Sunday service at 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary and on our YouTube channel, my title is Sky. It's about the eclipse too. I'll note that we won't have any special activities at First Unitarian on Eclipse Day, Monday, when there are so many other options in the community. So come here on Sunday to get ready for Monday. As Ginny said at story time, the Toledo Unitarians will offer OWL, O-W-L, classes. That stands for our whole lives to 10th through 12th grades, starting April 7, that's next, next Sunday. OWL is comprehensive and evidence-based sexuality education developed by the Unitarian Universalist Association in partnership with the United Church of Christ. Today is the enrollment deadline. So if you're interested in en enrolling your 10th to 12th grader, contact Ginny Gottman or Sandra Kosick Sills. An additional announcement, next week is the last week to bid in the silent auction for
for Simon Croak. Any questions you may have, you may take to Michael Croak or go online and Google Help Simon Now. Now I'll tell you about one event coming up here on Saturday, April 20, that hasn't yet gotten publicity. You might have seen some social media about what are called candlelight concerts when musicians perform a concert and the only light in the room comes from candles. Well, electric ones these days. But the low light of candlelight. We'll have a candlelight concert here in the sanctuary on the 20th. The string quartet from the Toledo Symphony Orchestra. We were pleased to make arrangements for this through our former music director, Mickey Finch. Fit inch. 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 Yeah, inch. That's what I'm getting for not wearing my glasses. That concert will be at 7 p.m. on April 20, though we request a donation. Admission is free. Please come and bring your friends. Final coming soon entry is for me to invite you to join us in Fellowship Hall after the day's service for coffee, conversation, and social time. And now please join me in reciting the words for us figuratively to send some Unitarian Universalist fire into the community while Phil extinguishes the chalice flame. And after this, our postlude for congregational singing will be hymn 118, This Little Light of Mine. And now our chalice words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of 